Hello everyone. The video you are about to see was originally broadcast on the Idea Cast channel, hosted by Justin McSweeney. In that, I'm joined by my good friend Greg Enriquez and somebody who I've talked uh, with a few times before, Michael Levin, and we're exploring the ideas of levels of ontology together. It's a rich and wonderful discussion. I hope you enjoy it. Normally, I say welcome to my guest uh, when I start an Idea Cast interview, but. I have three persons here who are of great significance to me and in my learning path and journey and my journey towards um, understanding wisdom and relating to wisdom. And I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. I welcome the YouTube audience. John, Greg, Michael, welcome to the three of you. I'm so glad to have you all here today. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And I want to acknowledge that you all have your own YouTube platforms, your own uh, huge social relevance. And so to be here on the show, again, I'm, I'm humbled and in, in, in gratitude to the three of you for doing this and coming here uh, and allowing me to just open up the space for you guys and be a close attendee of uh, what's about to unfold. So gratitude to you all for that. So, um, And I'll ask your charity here. I'm a lay person. I'm uh, one of those dreaded autodidacts, but I ground a lot of it in the humility of, uh, of FOK you know, <laughs> in Peronian uh, uh, yeah. inquiry. So um, I consider myself a student of the work of the three of you. And um, in my trying to think of how we start this out today is to... Um, Look at what Michael talks about in the audacity of the imaginal being grounded uh, in, in empirical evidence and the data and that dance between the two of them. And, and as uh, maybe we're opening the aperture on what intelligence does and what it might be. Uh, so and and looking at Greg's layered ontology. Uh, the, the joint points between different stages of, of self-organization. Uh, I think there's so much richness in territory. And of course, John, with his um, compendium of, of ideas and epistemological rigor. And, and, uh, and so I, I just see a beautiful uh, convergence here of the three of you. So I will be a good host. I'm going to step to the side. And uh, Greg, if you would like to just go ahead and maybe start the conversation. And, and uh, I know it's going to flow really well. So. All right. To you, Greg. Um, I appreciate Justin, uh, and it's a wonderful opportunity to be here uh, and to have some uh, opportunity to share ideas with people I admire greatly. Um, so here's what I'd like to just throw out there uh, and see, um, Michael. You probably you may have seen my depiction of a tree of knowledge diagram, uh, four uh, sort of upside down cones, as it were, uh, sort of emerging out of uh, energy information singularity source, uh, sort of a one world naturalism from a big history view. And it's really an expansion of complexification. Uh, but something happens at different points of it uh, that result in a qualitative shift. Uh, in particular, a life uh, plane of life emerges, a uh, plane of what I call mind animal and culture person. Um, and you know, it took me a long time to think about what these planes actually were coming off of, in particular, matter. The matter complexification seemed okay, but I wasn't sure exactly um, what was happening with these life, mind, and culture cones uh, for a couple of months, years after I developed it. And then I basically was like, oh, it's a complex adaptive system uh, networked together through information processing and communication systems that are affording uh, particular potentialities. Um, and they're then mediated by certain kinds of systems, uh, gene cell, to put it simply, nervous system animal, um, propositional language, collective human intelligence. I was enormously struck um, by your cognitive light cone analysis. Um, and one of the things I really wanted to talk with you about was uh, how you conceive of a cognitive light cone, uh, how you conceive of intelligence, um, the emergent evolution, um, and if there's a relationship between that cognitive light cone idea and the cones that I am depicting in terms of emerging complexification through information networks, uh, exploration of design space. And then what I'd like to do with that is connect, if that's the case, connect the edge of that and the contact of that with recursive relevance realization um, as a dynamic process uh, that we can at least uh, apply to see you know, how these things uh, emerge through what, how do we understand? So I'll throw that out there uh, and see if you would then you know, riff off of that and then pull John in in relation and then see where this thing might explode uh, after that. 
Well, I guess I guess I should start by just uh, describing this uh, cognitive light cone idea. And I should preface this by saying that uh, the version of it that's out now, which I think uh, I published in 2019 or so, is a is very much a 1.0 vision. So it it needs significant uh, improvement. That much is clear, and and I'm working on that now. But um, for for what exists uh, is it's the following. Um, we were I, I was actually at a Templeton meeting, uh, a conference of um, people studying diverse intelligence and things like this and um, Pranab Das tasked us with a with an with a challenge of uh, trying to come up with a framework in which you can simultaneously think about truly diverse beings so we're talking about not just the familiar apes and birds that we're used to and not just you know maybe an octopus and maybe a whale or something like that but but like really diverse so we're so we're talking uh co um, colonial organisms we're talking synthetic uh, co biology beings that are going to be that are and are going to be made cyborgs uh ais whether software or robotically embodied um hybrids so some sort of combination of living material and engineered material uh, possible aliens i mean all of it right mm -hmm. so so, so, and I've been thinking about this for a long time and I sort of took that as an opportunity to try, okay, let's, let's, let's try to formalize some of this. How, how do, how do we do that? And what I thought was really uh, fundamental to any agent, any, any, any being that we're interested in is uh, the scale uh, of its goals. I, I thought that goal directedness, right. Some degree of it. And I'm not, I, you know, I don't like binary categories. I'm not, I don't believe that there is a thing as goal directed or non goal directed. I like um, Norbert Wiener's uh, sort of uh, cybernetic scale that goes from passive matter all the way up to, you know, sort of human metacognition and, and, and whatever's beyond that. And so, uh, and so I, I thought, okay, so let's just for each one of these, uh, potential beings, let's, let's map out what is the largest goal that they could possibly pursue. So this, and, and so, and so the obvious, and so you collapse uh, space and time onto a two dimensional sheet. And so you get this thing that looks like Minkowski's light cones. And, uh, and so the size of the goals, right. And so you can, you can start to, uh, think of different cases. So, so if I ask you what you care about, and you say, I care about sugar concentration within this uh, 10 micron radius. And I have a memory that goes back about 20 minutes. And I have predictive capacity that goes forward about 10 minutes. Uh, you're probably a bacterium. And, you know, and if you tell me that you care about things that happen within a, I don't know, a hundred foot or a hundred yard radius or so, and you've got some memory going back, but you're really never going to care about what happens three months from now in the next town, I'm going to say you might be a dog. Right, that kind of thing, and and if you've got goals that are planetary scale goals about the way the financial markets and world peace are going to look a uh, hundred years after you're gone, you're probably a human, and mm -hmm. uh, and if you tell me that uh, that you can actually care for in a linear range, you know thousands of millions, uh, all you know sentient beings, then I'm going to say you're something beyond a standard, uh, you know, to modern human. I don't know what that is, but you know we 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 can't really do that yet. So. Um, so that's so that's the idea of these cognitive icons, and there's two kind of two things uh, that I'll just say about that, and then I'll stop. One is that I think these these cognitive icons interpenetrate. In other words, in the in let's say let's just take a, a human body for example, there are many many uh, subsystems that have their own inner perspective and their own goals that they're following in various problem spaces. That doesn't just mean three dimensional space, right? Your your body is home to all kinds of structures that live and suffer and strive in other spaces, physiological state space, um, uh, uh, metabolic space, transcription, you know, gene expression space, anatomical space, if you're an embryo or, or something like that. So we're not very good at recognizing these. And, um, uh, and, and, and there are many of these that, uh, that cooperate, uh, uh, compete and so on, uh, all at the same time. And that leads us to the second point, which I think is pretty critical. Um, I, I like this notion of, uh, so, so goal, we talk about goal directedness. I like this notion of teleonomy and, uh, teleology, of course, being goal directedness. And, and then there's this concept of teleonomy, which is defined as apparent goal directedness. Now, yep. some people use that word to soften the impact of teleology. They say, well, look, it's not really teleology. It's just, it's just apparent teleology, right? I'm not using it that way. I, 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 I am full blown into teleology. I think it absolutely is, is a necessary concept to, for, to, to have proper understanding. Um, what I think is important about teleonomy is this. Uh, it is in fact apparent goal directedness because it reminds you to take the perspective of some observer. There is some observer who has to set, who has to make hypotheses about what they're looking at. Now that observer, um, right in terms of 
what problem space is this agent operating in? What are their goals? What mm -hmm. uh, degree of competency do they have to reaching those goals when situations mm -hmm. change? All of this, all of these are, are hypotheses from the viewpoint of some other being, or in fact, the system itself. So, so once mm -hmm. you're past a certain level of, of, of uh, advancement on that spectrum, you too tell story, internal models about yourself. You, you, you have a model of yourself as an agent. So, mm -hmm. so you know, parasites uh, with you know, scientists, right, as external observers, parasites, um, conspecifics, predators, uh, and the system itself all have these perspectives on things. And so, so I think keeping that apparent in mind that all these things are not, I, I think, not objective um, kind of uh, universal truths, but actually some observer trying to make sense of the world as they look at themselves and other things. So that, that to me is, is, is the idea of these, these light cones. Lovely. And would you say, would it be fair to say then, uh, let's say, you know, a life gets started or whatever, 4 billion years ago, and then explodes, we would actually see in the universe, at least on planet Earth, essentially an emergence of life light cones, right? Um, in, in relation, would you say that? Yeah, I think that, um, and I know it's weird for a biologist to say this, but I'm, I, I don't think life is a super uh, interesting or discrete category. I think that right. that it's that that what's what I think is more interesting is cognition, the spectrum of cognition, and a wide a wide uh, you know a wide range of those things are overlapping. So certainly the cognitive, um, you know, if you think of a Venn diagram, right, the cognitive circle and the life circle overlap quite a bit. But I don't think they're the same circle, and I think you can have things that are on the spectrum that currently people would not call alive, which is why I'm less interested in that, uh, that yeah. characterization. Um, I do think that one thing that if, if I had to give a um, uh, definition of life, which I don't do, but, but if I had to, what I would say is that life is what we call things that are really good at scaling up their cognitive light cones. So mm -hmm. if you have a collection of pebbles, which are basically only good at uh, sort of energy minimization and things like that. And, and um, I, I, by the way, I don't think that's zero on the cognitive life. I think it's very low, but I don't think it's zero. But when you have a, when you have a rock made of those pebbles, you have not scaled the cognitive light cones, got exactly the same capabilities. But once you have life, what you find out is that it's arranged in a way where the components have little tiny light cones and the collective has a bigger light cone, a bigger cognitive light cone that, that actually extends into new spaces. So when we see that happening, when we see goal-directed systems uh, being multiplexed, so that the goal, the the size of their goals, they they get these grandiose, you know, longer-term, um, spatially and temporally goals, we call that life. I, I think that's mm -hmm. what that's what life is. But but I do think that that things that we would be hard pressed today to recognize life as as life can can have cognitive light cones and, and maybe gotcha. large ones at some point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. All right, I'll pause and see if John wants to jump in here. Well, yeah, there's a lot I want to talk about there. Um, I want to I want to uh, build off of Michael's idea of light cones, which I do mention in some of my lectures at uh, U of T, University of Toronto. Um, I want to note that there's two, at least two parameters within a light cone, as I understand it. There's reach and clarity, and um, I think that brings in uh, some of the work I'm doing about cognition in which I talk about the two meta problems of adaptivity. So if you're going to be a problem solver, there's two problems you're always solving as you try to become a more adaptive problem solver. One is anticipation, your ability, and I don't just say prediction, I think that's a little bit of a misnomer. I think if you predict and can't prepare, that's not very adaptive. And we have experimental evidence for at least living creatures that that's the case, right? Um, so I, I, I use the term uh, anticipation. So you want to anticipate um, uh, as deeply as you can. Uh, typically, it enhances the, the number and the kinds of problems you can solve because the earlier intervene in a causal pathway for a problem often, not always, but very often, the easier it is to solve that problem. It's much easier to avoid the tiger than fight the tiger is my sort of slogan. And that's this idea of the light cone. But the problem with that, uh, which is the second meta problem, is as you increase the reach, you increase the problem that has been the uh, besetting obsession of my career, which is the issue of relevance realization. Uh, the amount of information that you have available, the amount of information you have to store, all the possible combinatorially explosive combinations goes up exponentially. And you have the problem that you can't just arbitrarily choose from that what to pay attention to. You can't algorithmically search. And so you're somewhere between the arbitrary and the algorithmic. 
And this gives you the issue of relevance realization. Um, I have proposed a way in which the two theories, uh, because the two problems depend on each other, um, you don't you can avoid relevance realization, but what you do is you shrink your cone of anticipation very considerably. Um, and then if you want to increase your anticipation, you increase the relevance realization problem. Um, to make a very long, a complex argument, as brief as possible, it's something like the predictive processing is trying to always minimize error. It hits in inevitable trade-off relationships of error. If it tries to reduce bias, it increases variance. If it tries to reduce variance, it increases bias. If it tries to reduce the errors of exploring, it will right. It'll crash into other errors of exploitation. And there's all these inevitable trade-off relationships. And the idea is the predictive processing is going to create these opponent processes that give uh, what's called an optimal grip on the world. And that's what I mean by clarity. It's not just that you reach out well, but you know how to optimally grip what falls within uh, mm -hmm. your light cone. And that's how I think those two... Uh, go together. Now, what comes out of both the recursive relevance realization and especially the predictive processing is this idea of mutual modeling. Um, in predictive processing, you always have to model yourself. I don't, I don't mean model yourself as a self, please hear that, but you have to model yourself uh, when you're modeling the environment because you have to deal with conflation errors. That stuff that's happening because it's inside of you is getting projected onto the environment. This is, and so you're always trying to model the self to some degree to discount the errors being caused by your own embodiment. And so uh, this is the great insight that predictive processing runs off. Don't try to directly predict the world, predict yourself interacting with the world. And that will get or help to solve those problems in an interlocking fashion. And so what you get is you get, you're always, when you're modeling the world, you're always to some degree modeling yourself. And as you're modeling yourself, you're always to some degree modeling the world. The two are interpenetrating. And I, I think that goes a lot towards uh, the teleonomy that Michael was talking about, that there is something like a self-modeling going on. Now for me, and this might be where uh, uh, Mike and I are different, I think that that self-modeling uh, and relevance realization depends on a system in some sense taking care of itself. Um, my argument is to the effect that uh, relevance realization is always caring about this information rather than caring about that information. And care, and I'm not meaning the I'm not meaning the experiential affect. I'm trying to use this in a very broad, almost Heideggerian sense. Uh, you're caring for yourself is what gives you the capacity to genuinely care about this information or that. This information matters to you. That information doesn't initially because perhaps that matter actually matters to you, right? You've, you literally have to take it in, or you're not going to continue. And so I think that relevance realization grounds in autopoiesis. And so, I, you know, that's something we can talk about. I do think that life does represent a significant um, capacity change. And we can talk about whether or not there is cognition without caring, or maybe you have an analog for caring going all the way down, Mike. And I'd like to hear that because, as you know, I'm very interested in this deep continuity. I would put one thing to you that's at a little bit more of an abstract level, two points, and then I'll stop talking. One is if we all are sort of non-reductionists, and if you have a continuum with non-reduction, differences of degree eventually become differences of kind. Uh, because with non-reductive continuums, you, you have to have properties at upper levels that aren't in lower levels. And so I think you get real emergence, and I think that's a difference in kind. And I think that is a way in which your continuum and Greg's uh, a series of cones could plausibly mesh together. Here's my final point, and this is the point that I've been also doing a lot of work on, and Greg and I did a lot of it together on our Transcendent Naturalism series, is as we start to get this understanding of cognition, we see it as properly transjective always between the system and the world, always between the organism and the world. And that means these discoveries about minds are also discoveries, they're ontological discoveries about something about the, the structure of reality itself. And those two have to be understood together, how we are understanding. I, I, I get it as a continuum, but we talk about it in levels. And I, I accept that distinction. The levels are properly epistemic. Uh, the reality is a continuum. But what I mean by that is, as we find levels in the mind, I think unless we're going to face a 
correspond unless we unless we're willing to bite the bullet of a profound solipsism and skepticism we have to say that there's something uh, corresponding in levels of intelligibility in the world and that that's an ontological claim and for me that means we are deeply committed to a different kind of ontology than the flat ontology that we have been doing science in for quite some time so uh, and i won't belabor this this is some of the deeper uh, recovery of uh, uh, an older Neoplatonic ontology rather than the sort of flat ontology uh, we've been with. And I think this is important because I think that can ground a spirituality that is not just about psychological hygiene, but about genuine epistemological and ontological realization. So yeah. that's what I have to say about that. And I hope that made sense. That was really uh, <laughs> compressed. <laughs> uh, I'm trying not to hog up all the time, but Mike, uh, you always say a tremendously provocative things and I wanted to respond to them in kind. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, that, that was, that's, that's great. Um, I don't disagree with almost any of that. And I think that especially, and I mean, the, the, the whole, um, kind of some of these platonic ideas are, uh, really starting to come to a fore in some of our work. I haven't uh, written too much about it, but I, but I will, uh, as, as, uh, you know, the arguments get better and so on. So I'm, I'm on board with, with pretty much all of that. Um, I, I do. Uh, I'll, I'll just say one one thing about the kind of uh, continuum uh, business, and then and then um, I want to talk about a, a another. I want to add something to what you said, which is very interesting. Um, you know, uh, one one thing about uh, the, the, here, here's how I think about this difference where in terms of um, when differences of in degree become differences in kind, right? And this is why I called my framework tame as in technological approach to mind everywhere, because I really want to ground it, not, not because technology encompasses everything that there is, obviously that's not the case, but but the technological approach I think is, is interesting for the following reason. Um, let's just imagine the paradox of the heap, right? So you got a, you know, you got a pile of sand and you start taking the, the, the grains off and you say, well, when of it? So so, so here's what I think all of these, all of these claims are, including um, any kind of cognitive claim, any kind of uh, a claim about what systems uh, um, can and can't do in, the, in, in terms of intelligence and all that. I think these are all interaction protocol claims. They're, they're an engineering claims in the sense that what you're really saying is here is a way I can interact with that system. So for example, so mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about the heap first. If you if you tell me you need to move a pile of sand, I, I don't want to really know whether it's a heap or not. Here's what I need to know. Are we, am I bringing a spoon? Am I bringing a shovel, a bulldozer, uh, you know, dynamite? What, 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 what are we bringing? And so, and, and there will be lots of scenarios in which actually either one, right? A big shovel or, or, a, you know, or a small bulldozer will do. And so, so I think all of these things are fundamentally around a claim about what is the right way to interact with it. So when you tell me that a given system is somewhere on this, on this spectrum, I, I'm I'm less interested in finding sharp categories and and looking for kind of emergent um, uh, uh, new 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 uh, new uh, phase transitions and things like that. I'm much more interested in the question of so what tools are you telling me are going to be appropriate, right? So if you're telling me something is a simple machine, I understand it's rewiring and and hardware modification, and that's all you got. If you tell me that it's a cybernetic thing, I'm thinking ah, so I've got tools of uh, resetting set points and other aspects of cybernetics. If you tell me that it's a it's a it's a learning agent i say okay i understand we have training we have you know all, all the things that uh behavioral science can do and if you tell me that it's at the level of uh, you know hu let's say human or above discourse i say ah that means that i have certain other tools and also i may be changed by the encounter in other words unlike with a simple machine I, after we're done exchanging i'm also going to hopefully benefit mm -hmm. from your agency and we're going to have a different relationship so so to me, all of these things are not about looking for categories. They're about looking for ways we're going to relate to that to to whatever the you know the system is is in question, and and, and in a very specific way. You know, I I say engineering, which is applicable to kind of all of the left side of that spectrum, and then after that, it becomes you know other things. I don't know psychoanalysis or something, but 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 you know, and love and and friendship and whatnot. But 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 that's that's what I think these things are. I think these things are our interaction frames that we take up. And then we see, which is, which is why this is really critical. A lot of, um, people really, um, they have philosophical, um, kind of pre-commitments to where things are, you know, they'll talk about uh, category errors. They'll say, well, it's a category error to say that the cells and tissues can think and can, uh, I mean, I use the word think, but, but, you know, can we have intelligence and so on? I'm like, well, you know, in the middle ages, it was a category error to think that it was the same forces that, that moved rocks on earth and, and celestial objects in the sky, right? That used to be a category error, except that, 
these categories need to evolve with the science. And I think these are all empirical questions. I don't think we get to sit back and have feelings about what is and isn't intelligent. I think we have to do experiments. And you, so you pick a frame, you try it, you make a hypothesis about here's the space I think it's working in, here's the uh, goals I think it has, here's the degree of competency I claim it has. Let's try it. Let's let's do the experiments. We'll we'll intervene in some way. We'll see. Does this thing? And then we'll know. Am I overdoing it? Am I under? You know? Am I under recognizing mind? Am I over? Uh, am I over recognizing it? Um, then then we pick. So I think I think it's a it's a it's a scientific problem about optimizing relationships in the end. So uh, I think that's great, and um, I'm mostly in agreement with that too. Um, um, two things come to mind. I mean, I think there is still a proper philosophical job in that scientific endeavors experiment uh, presuppose things that therefore can't be given by scientific experimentation. That doesn't mean that philosophical level gets to dictate. It means that the two discourses have to continually talk to each other. And that's, of course, why I'm a cognitive scientist. For example, uh, the, the, the model you propose, which I think is good, there is a fundamental presupposition of relationality being central to uh, a grasp on ontology. And that opens up the question, well, notice that information and intelligibility are inherently relational things. Uh, maybe we should be prioritizing relationality over the relata in our ontology. That's a kind of philosophical question that emerges by reflecting on what is presupposed in yep. the science. And I think, Mike, and I, I hope you take this not as an insult, I think you're actually doing work that is pushing towards that, that's saying, pay attention to the relationality over the relata and prioritize that. And, and I think that is actually a deep and fundamental challenge to our kind of standard ontological grammar, which goes back to a Cartesian substance where we talk about but individual things having properties that can independently exist, independent of their relations to other things. And I think, and there's a lot of people, and I'm one of those group that are think, saying we need to challenge that fundamental Aristotelian ontology in order to actually accommodate into our worldview what the current science is disclosing. What do you think about that as what I just said? Yeah, yeah, no, I think I think it's exactly right, and I've I've sort of, you know, if you were to you ask some people what is the what is the central thing that persists through time, and they'll say, well, it's genes, and somebody else will say, well, it's information, and to uh, what I think it is is perspectives. I think mm -hmm. what we have is perspectives, ways to ways to re actually reduce. I mean, well, you know, a perspective is is a is a chosen reduction of all the stuff you could take in from some vantage point. You're going to agree to ignore some things. You're going to emphasize other things. So, so that so perspectives are what change, evolve, interact. Like I think it's all about interaction and perspectives. Observers, perspective, interactions. I think that's the basis of everything that's that that we have to do in science. And that, that's very similar to uh, Ladyman's uh, structural realism, that what is persistent across all the sciences are these kinds of broad, real patterns by which we're doing sort of this, like you said, this right. compression right. and uh, selection mm -hmm. of information. And, the, and what survives are not the particular semantic content we give to it, but sort of these structural patterns and, yeah. Yeah. and stuff. Like that. Yeah, I, I think that's something deep. And so what you have is you have not only a Neoplatonism up and down, you have a Neoplatonism across time, which I think mm -hmm. is really, mm -hmm. uh, really interesting. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to stop for a bit because I feel, feel that you and I are starting to get into a rhythm and I don't want to exclude uh, Greg at all. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I really appreciate uh, this, um, what you're doing. I make reference to your work Likewise. a lot because yeah, I, th yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think our work, I think our work is complementary and we mutually strengthen each other's positions in, in uh, a way that's intellectually respectable and justifiable. But I do think the same thing is the case for my work and Greg. So I want to have I want Greg to talk now. Well, actually, that uh, that's a nice segue because I do want to check in with you, Michael, in terms of what um, I mean. You're doing such intense, you know, brilliant theoretical work. Um, you and I touched on this a little bit in our private conversation. Um, you know, John and I talk about this meaning crisis. I'm a clinician. Um, I'm deeply concerned with you know, how we see ourselves as human beings and what science says about what we are, what we know, how we think about it, and how does that connect to wisdom traditions in a particular way. Um, and I see your work as, uh, as, as a brilliant empirical work, okay, that open, that challenges certain old pre-existing notions uh, that, that uh, you know, have at times dominated uh, the paradigmatic natural science view or um, 
uh, it, at least it opens up a wide variety of different perspectives. Uh, as a psychologist who looks at the way people think about themselves in the world, um, I hope we evolve to new frames. John and I are doing a, a series called Transcendent Naturalism, basically anchoring us in a naturalistic way to the potentialities of transcendence at individual and collective levels. What kinds of worldviews afford that? Um, and what kinds of understanding, scientific understandings of the world afford that? So I'd, I'd really like to hear your thoughts about that. What, what has been your experience as you open up this realm, as you share this teleomic perspective, uh, open up us thinking about light cones across a wide variety of different domains? What does it say about us in the universe from a scientific perspective? And what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great, great uh, topic. Um, I uh, so 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 I'll say something general first, and then I, I'll I'll dive into a specific example of what I think this this means. M overall, I I think the whole um, crisis of meaning thing is incredibly important. Um, the work that uh, that I try to do, I view uh, very strongly as trying to climb out of it, not uh, trying to um, reductively dig a hole deeper. And this is this is really important because I, I mean I'm not a clinician and I and you know but but I get tons of emails from people who say okay I've read your paper I understand that uh, you know I'm a collective intelligence of cells and now I'm uh, I don't know what to do with myself anymore I, I like like literally I don't you know I I don't and and I what what should, what should I do you know I and maybe I've read some Sapolsky and now I don't think I have free will anymore so like I'm really you know I'm really confused and I don't have any idea what to do right. So um, I that's that's uh, I, I think that's important because because I think it's really critical that the stuff that we do is uh, seen as what I think it really is, which is providing now a way to climb out of all of the things that we were told, uh, you know, by by evolutionary theory, by by neuroscience, by physics. Well, you don't have this, and actually, you don't have that, and and you know, and it's all about competition and, and survival of the fittest. So you know, we've got that, and so right. So so okay. I mean, those you know, there were a lot of bad ideas that needed to go. Great, but but now we've got to we've got to climb our way up the other side of this and, and rebuild on on a, on a better foundation. Rebuild some of the things that. Um, that are, that are necessary for, for us to flourish. And, uh, and I, I, yeah, I, I think, I think that's, that's part, partly what, what we're doing. And I think a huge part of that is the, the whole, the whole diverse intelligence field and this idea of imp building tools that go beyond our very narrow kind of monkey brain um, uh, affordances that we have for recognizing other kinds of minds, I think is critical. I think if we do this, things are going to be uh, once we are once we are able to recognize other sentient beings around us, and we commit to this notion of enlarging our own cognitive light cone, so that we actually can recognize and have compassion for beings that don't look like us, they don't have the same origin as we do, they're different, <clears throat> they're different in every way. Yeah, I, I I look forward to a future in which the kinds of distinctions that we make currently about you know with, with within the normal human uh, uh, variation we say oh that you know these are like us that was other that, that you know they're not like us they're, like these things are going to be so laughable in the future when when the wide you know when when really the freedom of embodiment really takes off and we're all you know in whatever right you you come into this world and you're not stuck with whatever body evolution just happened to have you know and genetics happen to have landed you in uh, the the diversity of bodies and minds that are going to be out there is going to make all these current distinctions completely laughable. And I think that's good. I think we have to, to mature. I think we have to drop a lot of old categories, which made sense in, in olden times, but they don't make sense anymore because they don't actually capture what's, what's unique about, about um, sentient beings worthy of, of, of compassion. And so, so, so anyway, so, so that's kind of the general stuff. Um, uh, I want, to, I want to say one one thing about uh, the the more specific issue of, of of what we are. So so this goes back to John's um, point about the problems that any any being faces. So there's one more interesting problem, which is which is this. It's uh it it, it goes across scales in evolution. It's called Bateson's paradox, and the idea is that if you're a species the world's going to change and you've got two options. You, you, if you don't change, you try to remain the same, you're done for, you're, you're going to, you're going to disappear. If you do change in a certain sense, you've also disappeared because now you're something else you've changed. So mm -hmm. every, every uh, agent faces this interesting problem that if you're going to persist or better yet learn and improve and you know, whatever your journey is going to be, you are not going to be the same. So committing to a static uh, representation of what you are is 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 doomed, right? We we it's doomed at the evolutionary scale. It's doomed at the personal scale for for the following reason. Um, 
And, and this and this also goes back to the point that John raised about um, the relevance uh, or the salience you you called it or no I called it salience you said relevance um, of of information. Imagine let's let's just for a minute think about the butterfly caterpillar kind of situation, right? So so you got a caterpillar. Caterpillar lives in a two dimensional world, eats leaves. And it has to turn into, and it's a soft bodied creature. So it's a very particular kind of controller you have to have when you can't push on anything. There are no hard parts, um, has to turn into a butterfly. So, uh, in order to do that, what happens is the brain basically gets dissolved. Most of the cells are killed off or the connections are broken. You build a new, a new kind of brain. So the, so, so one amazing thing that has been found, uh, in various systems is that the butterfly or moth actually remembers things that you train the caterpillar on. So memories persist. Now, you might focus on the question of, wow, where is the memory? If you refactor the brain, how do you still have it? And so that's a fantastic question for, for developmental biology, for actually computer science. We don't have any, any memory media that do work that way. But there's a, but there's a, deeper, there's a deeper issue here, which is that, um, oh, and so, oh, and so I should say what it is that they learn. So, so you, you, you have a disc of a particular color, uh, let's say, I don't know, purple, and, uh, and the, the caterpillars learn that they get fed on this purple disc. And then when you get the butterfly, it will go there and, and, uh, and try to eat. Well, here's the interesting thing. So not only do butterflies and caterpillars not eat the same stuff, okay? Caterpillar wants leaves. Butterfly doesn't care about leaves. Butterfly wants nectar. Not only that's the case, but also the, the physical embodiment is completely different. So what you have to do, it's not enough to keep the memory as it is. The memory as it is, is completely useless. You have to transform that memory, mm -hmm, keep the mm -hmm. salience, dump the details and remap it into a new. So, so another sort of a, a weirdly grandiose way of putting it is in your new life, in your new higher dimensional life, like literally, because the butterfly lives in a 3D world. So literally in your new high dimensional life, you will not store, you will not uh, uh, keep the memories of your past life, but you will keep the deep lessons you learn. Right. You're not going to mm -hmm. you're not going to know that, that 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 moving certain muscles in a certain stimulus, uh, get, you know, gets you to leaves. Mm -hmm. You don't care about leaves. You don't have those muscles anymore. You have something completely different. And so so being able to remap across, you know, what, when when everything changes, right, being able to remap that information is is really fundamental. And so when we think about what we are, uh, here's 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 what I'm getting at. Um, you might think that what we are, you know, so you might think, okay, so, so butterfly caterpillar, that's a really sort of extreme example. I mean, we don't do that. A planaria that learn and then you chop off their heads and they regrow a new brain and they imprint their memories. Okay. We don't do that. So these are like weird. Uh, I think, uh, this is this is all of us. This is we we are absolutely that that type of being that mm -hmm. is not a static structure, and, and our job is to keep that structure intact against uh, you know all the things that happen. Fundamentally, I think that uh, at, at at any at any given moment, you don't have access to the past as it were, what as it was. What you have access to are the engrams, the 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 messages that your past mm -hmm. self left for you in your in your brain and your body. And you have to interpret those, right? So, so puberty, you know, will, 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 will alter your brain in various ways. All your priorities will change. You know, your preferences will change in many ways. When you're, when you're 90, you will still have memories of your, of your childhood, but, but not because you've kept the, there is no molecular structure in the brain that stays the same for that period of time. I mean, everything's you know, bubbling around molecules come in and out cells and so on. Um, what, what you are constantly doing is reconstructing yourself and your memories mm -hmm. to make them applicable in the new, it, you know, in the new scenario. So this, mm -hmm. this, so what does this look like across scales? Uh, for the human, it just means that as things, uh, as things in your, in your brain and body go in and out, you are, you are maintaining a coherent self model of some sort in mm -hmm. evolutionary terms. It means that evolution long before we had brains or any of that doubled down on this idea that everything is going to change. You know, the environment is going to change. Your parts are going to change because you will be mutated. We know you're going to change. Mm -hmm. And so this is why we have these amazing examples of, you know, when, when we make tadpoles with an eye on its butt instead of in its head, they, they, they don't need new, new generations of adaptation. They can, they can see and they can learn in visual assays immediately, right? We, there, there are many, the, I, I write about this stuff all, a, a lot. There are many amazing situations where you can, you can radically change uh, the, not just the environment, but actually the, the parts themselves. You can put, you know, put in weird nanomaterials and then all this stuff. You always get something coherent because I think, because uh, what biology does is assumes 
that you can't you can't just learn the structure of the past. You have to learn. You have to make problem solving agents and and the body and and then then eventually the the you know the brain and the mind are uh, are are continuously reconstructing because you know everything is changed. So uh -huh. so this and, and there's there's some other there's some other things that could be said about that, but I'll I'll, I'll stop in a minute. This is just uh, I I think this is one of those things that we're learning from all of this is that if you want to know what we are. It is it is less uh, plausible to think of ourselves as um, some sort of static structure that tries to hold on to the to the you know to the engrams of the past. We are reinterpret. We are we are a continuous process of sense making and reinterpretation. I mean, I'm obviously not the first person to say this, but but but, but we now see that across scales, right, from from evolutionarily to molecularly to developmentally, from um, from from the um, robustness of the body to the robustness of cognitive systems, you know, confabulation, like all this. Uh, you know, the, the, the noise and the unreliability of the substrate is not a bug. It's a feature. It's the thing that makes us intelligent and robust because you assume right off the bat that everything's going to change and that our number one um, f f fundamental capacity is to remap onto onto new onto new scenarios right and That's and if you think about if you think about what happened in in computer science and and robotics they went exactly a different way right so we work super hard to make sure that your hardware always works correctly and then we right. code on top of that knowing that our hardware is reliable and you end up with a completely different set of systems versus what biology does which is it, it knows all the stuff underneath is going to change it's going to die it's going to mutate it's going to be poison uh and we're still going to remap. So, so that's, you know, this is one thing that I think we're learning about what we are. That's really fascinating. Have you ever by any chance come across relational frame theory? I don't know if uh, no. it's, a, it's a bridge off of uh Skinnerian theory, but basically mm. what it's essentially saying is the operant is a relational set of patterns rather than a particular thing um, or stimulus, but actually what you're doing is you're tracking patterns and being pulled into operant patterns through relational frames. So listening to that, and that's very, I think, consistent, both with John mentioned structural realism, really the idea of what we can really track in the world are patterns uh, and, and track patterns. And yeah. if we're building our recursive relevance realization salient structures, in an unbelievably changing world, what are the things that we can track? Well, pattern relations might be the thing uh, that affords our cybernetic goal tracking. Yeah, yeah, and and one and one last kind of piece to to, to throw in there is that um, if you think about if if the goal uh, or if if what biology does is take a uh, some kind of complex because uh, uh, some kind of complex state of of, of uh, you know stimulus and, and effects and all of that squeeze it down into a very compressed representation and then and then try to re re expand right so so the caterpillar learned all this stuff it gets squeezed down into some sort of sort of molecular substrate and then re expanded or remapped onto the onto the butterfly that that squeezing is so 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 two just two quick things about that one is that this the squeezing and expanding thing is everywhere so 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 yep. metazoan yep. organisms right you got your organism you squeeze it down to an egg you re expand you you and i having this conversation I have some sort of complex brain state. If I gave you a, a, a you know a, a spreadsheet of of all my neuronal um, activation levels, th that that would do you no good because your your brain is is different. What we do is we use language. We squeeze it down to a to a simple low bandwidth message. You will have to re-expand and and reinterpret that message. You know, do I know that you re-expanded it the way that I did? No, but you know, we 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 do our best. But that that like squeeze, right? You can think of science this way, as in writing papers and and giving talks, is like the squeezing down and then. So, so as we as as we think about, so I've been thinking about this a lot about um, what what are the features of the architecture that would allow this, you know, that would that would enable this kind of amazing you know process. And one of the things that um, that struck me was um, William James had this really cool thing when he said uh, uh, he said the thoughts are thinkers, and and if if you can if you can dissolve and I, I I just like doing that dissolving boundaries between things. So so if you dissolve the boundary between data and the cognitive system that operates on that data, then you might say that, well, maybe the data isn't just passive. Maybe the thing you learned isn't just a passive thing that sits there and is hoping for uh, this this other cognitive system to come and read it and and you know and and remap it. But maybe it's got a little bit of, I don't know how much, but maybe it's got a little bit of activity on its own. Maybe it's got an agenda. Maybe the agenda that it has is to be properly or optimally placed 
in some cognitive system. Maybe it wants to be understood. You know, yeah. I'm using quotes because I don't know to what degree, but I actually don't think that 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 there's a sharp boundary here. So maybe memories uh, are not actually. Um, I I, th- I thought of this again because of the frame theory um, thing you mentioned. Maybe these 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 uh, these patterns, these frames, and maybe even perspectives are have a little bit of uh, agency to them. They they help. The reason that the reason that any of this works is because it's not just okay. Here's a here's a, a passive molecule. Good luck figuring out what what this may, well, you know meant to your to your past self. But actually, maybe these things have a little bit of um, activity in terms of working to get themselves remapped. Maybe it's again, it's like this two you know two directional thing. So I don't know. That's just that's just some stuff that we've been working on lately. Well, I want to reply to a lot of this. This is really rich. I want to start with that idea of kind of a bi-directional conformity that it's not only the mind is conforming to the world, but the world is conforming to the mind. Of course, you might get tired of me doing this. This is a Neoplatonic claim, right? And this is the idea. This is this is this is sort of the central idea behind what I call participatory knowing. Um, and so uh, that we, it's not just a passive reception. It's a co-shaping. It's a mutual affordance. It's a coming together. It's a logos. Um, I think that is deeply right. And I think that's at the core of what I try to get at when I talk about um, um, participatory knowing. And I think relevance is a uh, cognitive psychological phenomenon that is exactly that, uh, that we aspectualize the world and it's sort of it, but it relevance isn't just objectively given. We don't just read it off, but we don't just project it onto an empty canvas. The world and us shape and coordinate each other so that we fit together and you know this and you this is kind of like an analogy an analogous to how niche construction works and and mm. things like mm. that right there's yeah. activity on both ends Absolutely. there's shaping on both ends so i think that's deeply right and i think that that what you just said that compression and in the 2012 paper we did on relevance realization we talked about compression and particularization as sort of the engine yeah. uh, of how you get the mind, at least what we were talking about in that paper, how you get it to be doing something that is structurally the same as what evolution is doing. You get the variation and then the compression. And this means that noise in the system is actually inherently valuable, as you indicated a few minutes ago. Um, And what's happening is machine learning is actually finally figuring this out, that you have to, at, at very many stages, you have to throw noise into the system to break it up so it doesn't get locked into local minima and it can explore many more environments than the one it's getting locked into. And mm-hmm. I think that is very important. And I, I'm building towards an argument here because I think that maps into something that goes with your butterfly that human beings do. And this is L.A. Paul and transformative experience. Human beings go through these profound changes in, in right and so she gives she does the Gedanken experiment of people offering to turn you into a vampire, which is very much like your butterfly example. And the problem is you don't know what it's going to be like, what your perspectives are going to be like. You don't know who you're going to be, what your preference yeah. structure is going to be, your traits. And so you don't know if you should do it or not do it because you're ignorant. You're deeply ignorant. So you can't do standard decision metric inference your way right. through. Right. Um, and um, this is very interesting. And she says, of course, you face this when you decide to have a child or you decide to take up long term education or you decide to get into a long term romantic relationship, et cetera. You, so I, I think this is exactly right. And I think transformative experience is pervasive in our cognition. And when you put that uh, together with what we just said a few minutes ago about the noise and all of this. What this means is our model of rationality has to be fundamentally changed because yep. here's the, and this is what Agnes Keller does. Well, I'm not very rational right now and I'm aspiring to be more rational. I'm actually aspiring to go through a transformative experience. So this is actually central to being rational. Like being rational is a, is a normative demand that I become more rational than I am. And it's not just a quantitative more, it's a, it's a qualitative, it's a transformative experience. So somehow these non-linear, non-inferential processes are central to being a rational agent because rationality is fundamentally a transformative experience. And what I'm saying is this feeds back. And then that rationality also has to take account of this perspectival and this participatory knowing. We're not we're not representing things over there. We're as you're suggesting, Mike. We we are we are participating. The world and uh, and us we're participating together in the co-instantiation of you know, important real relations. And and I think therefore that Bateson's paradox actually slams into the paradox of self-transcendence, which is 
well, if I become something that other than I am, then it's not self-transcendence because something other has come in. And if I just extend what I am, then it's not transcendence, it's just growth. And yeah. that paradox is only a paradox if you have a static single model of the self. But if you have a model that is flowing, and I'll connect to something else you say, a model of the self that is inherently co a collective and flowing the way you're doing it, I think you put those together and you get right multiply mutually evolving selves. I don't think we are a self in um, any kind of monadic sense, I think. And this is what the th a lot of the therapy, all the parts work and the IFS and a whole bunch of stuff. We are properly dialogical. We are dialogical within, we are dialogical without. And trying to find sort of the soul thing that is the self is a mistaken category. And this becomes important because when you look at debates, I'm, I'm teaching a course on the self right now, and Greg and I with Christopher Master Pietro uh, did a, a series called The Elusive Eye. People will say the self isn't real. And then what they'll do is the arguments are because they'll admit that all this stuff we're talking about is going on and, and that's all there, but that's not a self. Well, why? Because it doesn't give you something like a soul, a single monadic substance that's on the unchanging bearer of properties. And then they say, therefore, it's not real. And I turn around and I say, well, then by that standard, nothing is real, because what science is showing us is that nothing is a substance. So all you you're really saying is the self is as real as everything else or uh, as unreal as everything else. I think saying everything is unreal is a useless thing to say. Right. Um, I don't think that gets you anywhere or advances anything. Um, and so I think what we're, we're, what we're, what this self, no self debate is ultimately pointing to, and I'm trying to show you it's deeply continuous with the biology you've been arguing is we have, we're facing a fundamental transformation in what we understand the self to be dialogical and what we understand rationality to be. And I think those two things are really profoundly important at a cultural level. But if you've, if you've agreed with the argument I've made, they ground out in deeper stuff in the biology and let alone even in the physics. And I think this gives them powerful plausibility because we're proposing a fundamental paradigm shift. Here's the final thing I'm going to say. I think that tra that mutual transformation of the notion of self and rationality is crucial to getting out of the meaning crisis. Mm -hmm. I think as long as we remain in that Cartesian framework, we are locked. We are locked into nominalism. We are locked into dualism. Mm -hmm. We are locked into antagonistic processing. Um, uh, and we are locked into all, all many of the central drivers of the meaning crisis. I think that's a, um, did you want to respond to that, Mike, or? No, I, I have things, but please go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I mean, I, I think certainly, so one of the things that I, you know, one of the things that I would be looking for, uh, and this is what John and I are doing in the transcendent naturalism, um, is, is to consolidate certain kinds of messages that afford people ways of gripping the world, mm. uh, that, that enable them to, um, make sense of their lives, make meaning in their lives, you know, as ec ecological agents, <laughs> you know, in a particular exploration of design space and finding that kind of participatory relation, you know, as being sought in a, you know, there, there is a way to embed oneself on the cusp of this aging arena relation, I believe, that many wisdom traditions have identified, you know, as being fundamentally core to one's sense of being present in the world. And I, I to me, one of the things that your work is doing, one of the things that I was so drawn to John's work, um, and again, sort of as a way to share with people ways of being in the world, to me, what it is that this shows scientifically, philosophically, and participatory is it points a particular direction uh, for, in many ways, at the core being in the world. There's a relationship to the world uh, that emerges in, in this dynamic process. I think from both of your work, um, that is, is a very, very important transformation for us to communicate society and embrace um, as we go through. Uh, so that's, again, I kind of keep coming back for me, is uh, gripping these elements to embed our structure, our grammatical structure of relating to nature, to the world, to the future uh, in a particular way is deeply important to me. So I just wanted to make mm -hmm. that point and resonate with it.
Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I, th- uh, I, I love all of that. I think, I think you're absolutely right. And, um, I think it's, it's critical for us, uh, when, for, for, um, for, for people to realize that when we reimagine what the self is and take away, take, take us away from this, this notion of a, of a substance, you know, um, um, some kind of monadic substance and all that, um, it's different than w- what you said before, which is uh, that well, the, the, it's you know every everything is equally illusory. I mean, there's there's nothing at that point. Well, it, it's that, that's a deeply destabilizing concept for a lot of people, and I think that's where that's where mm-hmm. they think we're going. And um, the example that I try to uh, the example that I I I, I try to um, help people think about is this. Um, I mean, it is it is true that that we are patterns more than anything else, but like okay so so you've got a rat and you train the rat to press a lever and get a reward now if you if you zoom into what's going on here you've got some cells that have interacted with the lever you've got some cells that got the sugar of the reward they're not the same cells there is, there is no single cell that had both experiences who owns the collective uh, who owns the uh, associative learning that just took place there so so there's this rat right which is which is a group of uh, a, a group of um, competent subunits and there's uh, some mechanisms which that's the research program is to study them i call them a cognitive glue that's what, kind of what we work on is to figure out okay what so 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 something has appeared here it isn't nothing something has appeared here which which is a pattern that has memories it can have goals it can have preferences is it can have competencies that the individual parts don't have and it's perfectly reasonable so you know somebody said somebody like literally said i, I read your thing about this collective intelligence what do i do now and all i could say was what, whatever amazing thing you were going to do before you read my my paper go do that like that you can still do it. like you can still do all that because because you can even though uh you you know you're 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 a set of patterns um, that are interacting in a particular way you can become a better pat- pattern a more a more interesting a richer pattern and 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 that is what we can do and so commit to commit to a bigger cognitive light cone to, to helping others uh you know have a better embodiment whatever it's going to be um it isn't it doesn't it doesn't dissolve all that stuff it just gives you a new window on it and uh you still after all that is said and done you still got the the, the opportunity and uh the responsibility of moving forward as that and 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 doing things um so yeah i want to reply to that i think that's right i mean i think i think getting it clear to people that we're not dissolving we're revealing or disclosing we're disclosing as opposed to dissolving i think is and that's what i was trying to argue for um and i agree uh uh, with what you said, tell people to go back and uh, uh, maybe use this to reinterpret so they can recover what has been lost uh, because of an inappropriate frame. Um, I, with the Verveki Foundation's help, we set up ecologies of practices. Uh, we have a practice called Dialectic into Dialogos that helps people get into mutually shared flow states of cognitive exploration and people discover collective intelligence as something that is phenomenologically present and almost agentic in what's happening. Mm -hmm. They get the we space that takes on a life of its own and leads people into each other and everybody beyond each other into something deeper and more profound. And people will say things like, I discovered a kind of intimacy I didn't know existed and I've always been looking for. And if that doesn't sound platonic to you, I don't know what does. That's anamnesis through and through, right? And so I agree with what you said, but what I'm also suggesting, Mike, is if we if we and if we, we have to do this carefully and ethically and virtuously and with virtuosity, but we can reverse engineer by paying attention to the wisdom traditions and the science, the cognitive science, the kind of science you're doing, we can reverse engineer practices for people that help them to do uh, the recovery and also the development of the cognitive light cone, uh, right, uh, of a recovery of a lot of have, uh, what is lost for people in the meeting crisis? Uh, just, just there's so much more, but just pick up on that sense of this is a they 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 say they had always been looking for this kind of intimacy, but they didn't realize that they were. That's a really interesting state that they're mm-hmm. and and we're getting this and this we get this across groups who come in. I, I, I don't, I'm not pretending it's a, a random sample. It's obviously self-selected. People are coming in because they have some orientation to my work. So I'm not claiming this is like a scientific study, but it's not nothing either. The fact that many deep, different groups of people, religious, non-religious, many different backgrounds, different places in the world come together. And this is a reliable thing that happens. 
I think that's that's indicating something that so yes we can tell people yes go back and try to recover do the wonderful things you're trying to do and 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 don't make it don't try and dissect it away because of a cartesian framework but on the other hand here's a bunch of new practices or at least old practices that have been recovered or at least reverse engineered in which people can deeply recover a lot of the experience and the learning of what we're talking about here. So it goes from being something they may propositionally assert into being something they procedurally and perspectively and participatorily realize. And I think that's an important thing to say uh, as well. Uh, so when, when people ask, and I'm not saying you have that responsibility, I have chosen to take on that responsibility and a lot of people with me, I don't, I'm not taking single credit. But I think one of the things to say is to say what you say by all means, but also to say, well, why don't you try ecologies of practices that are based on this and see the positivity that comes out of being in these practices, see what you realize and recover in these practices. And I know Greg is doing something very similar and our work, uh, Greg is, you know, Greg is a powerful theorist, but he's also creating an, an, an ecology of practices and, and he, he his work and the, my work and the foundation's work, we're, we're doing a lot together. I, I just want to know what, I mean, obviously there's, there's great risk here. There's people turning into gurus. There's, you know, weird cult formations. There's exploitation. There's money pumping. Uh, you have to do a lot. You have to try to build a lot in to safeguard against this. But I'm proposing that we could sort of reverse engineer a complex ecology of practices that could be properly understood as spiritual in that it affords people transformative experiences in which they are recovering this deep connectedness, this intimacy, their learning and, and reality and themselves are being deeply disclosed together within and without and with, you know, between each other. And you're getting the cultivation of a reorientation towards meaning, virtue, wisdom. I think this is also something we can say to people now. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's uh, where you find, you know, uh, the the bridge from a lot of the is of the science to the, you know, odd of humanism and, and an, a new opening uh, for uh, fusion and connection. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, Mike, I haven't seen uh, and I certainly haven't tracked all of your stuff, but I am, I know you focus on continuity and I, I know the approach that you take, but I have, I'm curious, I just wanted to make sure I had this opportunity to ask you, um, when you think about the human condition and the human intellect, um, and you think about kind of, you know, is there something, what is the thing, what are the multiplicity of things, uh, when you think about the human intelligence structure, um, what do you identify, uh, if anything, uh, that is, you know, kind of at the root of our explosion over the last half million years into dominating the planet, building technologies, giving rise to certain kinds of thought? Um, where do you see that? Do you think much about that particular kind of question? Have you reflected on that? I, uh, I'd just love to get your thoughts since I have, have you here. Uh, on yeah. That. Um, well, let's see. I know it's a little bit of a switch topic, but I wanted to check in with you on it. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I don't think I have anything uh, brilliant to add over what a lot of smart people have said about um, the unique um, uh, capacities of, uh, of 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 humans uh, and why and why we're you know this is such a successful embodiment and all that. Um, I can say I can say a couple of things. First, um, someone and I don't remember who it was, but but someone said that uh, maybe Yuval Harari. I don't know. So, somebody said that. Um, the the uh, special thing that humans have is uh, that we're we're storytellers, and and I think that's a compelling vision. Except that I think all, all agents are storytellers fundamentally, from the first bacterium that had to compress uh, a, a very chaotic, noisy experience into a simple model of of what the hell is going on and which of my effectors can I use to to improve certain scenarios. You're now a storyteller. You are now, you are no longer Laplace's demon trying to um, track microstates. You have committed to a certain story of what effectors you have and what's going on. I think we're all storytellers. So I don't think it's that. I mean, I think we crank it up to an amazing degree. And I think that language, you know, I, I'm sure language is an important part of it in the sense that uh, that that compressive 
uh, that 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 tool that can compress complex brain states into a simple thing that can be can be passed on to somebody else for uncompression, I think is super powerful. And as much as I like to use uh, various tools of cognitive and behavioral science in, in other places, I, I've not seen anything that suggests that that language is exists other, other than than in brains. So I, you know, I wouldn't claim that. Although we don't know, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying we haven't we haven't seen anything like that. So I think I think language is key. Um, I would say a couple of other things uh, about humans. One one weird thing about humans is that we have we have a cognitive light cone that's longer than our lifespan, which is which is a bit different. That uh, you know, if you're a goldfish. Um, all of your goals are likely achievable, right? You might have a 20 minute uh, horizon of goals and you're probably going to live 20 minutes and, and most likely your goals are all achievable. Humans are a uniquely, uh, we, we, have, we have many goals that are absolutely not achievable in our lifespan and we know it. And so what kind of you know, unusual pressures or capabilities that unlocks, right? Having, having goals that you can commit to that you know are, are, are not achievable within your own lifespan, maybe, maybe that's something. Mm. And I guess the final thing, the final thing I'll say is that, uh, and this this becomes very important because people try are now because of AI and all this, people are trying to define you know proof of humanity certificates and and, and these kinds of things. Um, I, I want to say a couple of things about what a human is or and isn't according to my uh, my humble opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. If you um, for, for the the first thing to realize is that, and I have a, I have a diagram of this, but I'll try to sort of pantomime it. Um, you got your you got your standard modern human in the middle, and it's got this like a gentle glow about him, and all the philosophy is about the human, you know, the human. And so so going up back here above him is a is a very um, smooth gradation of of evolutionary stages all the way back to a single cell microbe. And when you say the human. Well, which human? So the human of today, the human of a hundred thousand years ago, the human of three hundred thousand years, ago, right? It's you know, it's and they say, well, it developed, you know, this and that developed very fast. They say, what's very fast? One generation? No, 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 no. It takes you. Well, then, what was going on in between, right? If you think that humans have responsibilities and right, you know, they can be good and you, where exactly, right? What can you blame one of these hominid ancestors for what they did, or are they still right? So, so you got this spectrum, right? I mean, I like continue one spectrum okay mm -hmm. down below you got the exact same thing on a um developmental time scale so again what human you used to be an unfertilized oocyte I, it was a very slow and gradual process of how we got here so which human are we talking about and then even more more sort of uh, uh widen this all out horizontally you can imagine now now as we will with tech, as we already are and will more with technology you can step away and you say well i can modify i can be modified biologically I might get some some tentacles and I might live underwater someday. And I really would like to see an infrared. I mean, what's this with these limited retinas, you know? And and so so you can biologically, also technologically, right? I can have implants and all kinds of, uh, you know, at some point today, maybe 2% of my brain is, a, is an implant that's helping me out. But eventually it might be, you know, 58% of my brain is, is some kind of, you know, construct. So so you got so you got all of this. And and then that really, I mean, obviously, you know, science fiction has been on top of this for, for 100 years. But a lot of people, especially who talk about AI, are just now catching on to this idea that human is not a sharp category. And then that raises the question of, so, so what do we really mean? And, and I, I tend to think about this as the kind of thing that, um, you know, you're, you're going to Mars for the next 30 years. You get to take something with you. What do you take with you? What, what's important that you take? You know, you don't want a Roomba. You don't want, you know, you want, to, what, what, do you, what are you really looking for, right? So I want a human companion. What does that mean? Is it the DNA? Do you care about the DNA? I don't. A lot of people are super into the DNA. And if you change your DNA, my God, then, you know, you're no longer, I don't care about DNA. Uh, it's then, then people are like, well, it's the standard body. You know, once you've put wheels on and gotten, you know, tentacles and a propeller, you're no longer human. I don't care if you have all your standard parts that evolution happens to have given you and you're subjected to back, you know, lower back pain and astigmatism, all this dumb stuff that we ended up evolving. Uh, I don't think that's, I don't think that's what we mean by human. So what do we mean? So, so I think it's really interesting to think about what's essential about it. And I think what we mean when we say human is a certain impedance match between us with respect to the size of your cognitive light cone of compassion. Literally, like, what are the size of your goals and how, what, you know, what, what is the radius of compassion that you can muster? Because if you're, because, because, and actually the mismatch can be in either direction. If, 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 the, if the cognitive light cone is tiny, we're not going to have much of a relationship if you can't care about the same level of thing. But conversely, too, if you've got this like 
you know, galactic scale mind, uh, we may not be able to do the normal thing that, you know, the, the, the normal human interaction. So, so I think, I think that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the size of your, of your goals and the things you can care about in the compassion sense of the act, the practical, not the affect, but, but the practical like pursuit of goals. That's, that's what I think. Lovely. I really appreciate that. Yeah. I want to respond to that because I think that's important. I think that I agree with Mike, uh, the discussion, I think the discussion around human is actually an equivocation. I think it's equivocation from some sort of biological notion. And Mike is just can just devastate that as he just did. And another notion, which is a moral legal notion, which is a person. Um, and there, we've got enough science fiction that lets us know that you don't have to be humans to be persons. And then I think we try to find some anatomical locus of personhood within a biological humanity. And that is just a doomed project from the doomed. beginning that will not work. And I think a lot of the tech people and the AI people are, are, are like they're bumping into this, but they're bumping into it. And we've said this multiple times with old categories and old schemas. And they're saying often equivocal and sloppy things about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I mean, and the, and the move you made and, you, of course, you brought this in, Mike, you brought in the notion of compassion. This is ultimately, you know, a Kantian but even properly a Hegelian move. It's like, well, persons are beings that can recognize each other as having moral responsibility and moral obligations. And uh, I give that to you as you give that to me. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The golden rule. All, and I, I'm trying, I'm, uh, I'm compressing a huge amount of much more sophisticated <laughs> argument. But this notion of reciprocal uh, recognition of our responsibilities and our authority, um, I can obligate you. I can say, don't do that because that's immoral. Uh, and I don't have to appeal to your desires. I don't have to appeal to your projects. I can just say, don't do that. That's immoral. And you are... If you're a moral agent, you're at least responsible to that. You don't have to agree with me, but you're responsible. <laughs> to that. And I think, and, I, and you know, and Hegel said this is when we become geistlich. We become spiritual beings when we become capable of this reciprocal recognition of moral authority and moral responsibility such that we are no longer driven just by our desires. We can be driven by what we are obligated to do. Unless people think I'm just talking about ethics reason is that kind of obligation thing. You should conclude this because of that. And I can say that to you regardless of your desires. In fact, we criticize people, motivated reasoning, who deviate from what they should conclude because of their desires, etc. Sorry for that. They're building a battleship next door. Um, uh, and it's, 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 it's very annoying. Um, so I think that that compassion, if you understand it more broadly as this reciprocal recognition of normative uh, responsibility and normative authority, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about personhood. And notice we do that even with human beings. We, we do this weird thing. We don't obligate two-year-olds to our moral obligations because, and we say, well, we, they're persons. Well, they are and they aren't. They're in this nebulous status. They're persons in that we have moral obligations to them because by undertaking those moral obligations, we will actually turn them into persons. And mm -hmm. and and so, but we don't let two-year-olds get married. We don't let them vote. We don't let them bear arms. We don't let them drive cars. Uh, we can hold them in a location, kidnapping them. Uh, we can force them to go where we want, like, like, but many of the standards of personhood, we don't allow them to have. And so I think what needs to be done is a clean separation from this discussion of human, which can mean some kind of psychological, psychobiological, psychosocial biological entity. And, and I agree totally with you, Mike. I think trying to pin that down is a fool's errand. And I think the reason, the right, what, the reason why people are trying to pin that down is they're trying to find a place for personhood. Yep. And here, I know you don't like it, but here I think that is a category mistake. I think personhood is different from, and it is not locatable in a psychosocial biological entity. It's about this capacity for yeah. mutual recognition, reciprocal recognition. I, I don't disagree with that. I, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, I would just say that it's a degree, right? That's all. That's all I'm saying is that I think it's a. So, so for example, you know, we in the let's take the legal system. We've arbitrarily decided that 18 means adult. Yeah. 
Yes. Right. I, I mean, it's it's total nonsense. Nothing happens on your on your you know at the, on your 18th birthday. However, um, what what at, at least in the U.S. the um, if you want to rent a car, you got to be 25. Why 25? They didn't do what the legal system did, which is just to kind of guess and and well, to just to you know kind of set it. They they have actuarial data. And they just yeah, realized yeah. that 25 is when your brain's mature enough that we ought to be, uh, you, you, ought, you could be trusted with a car. That's, that's empirical, you know, that, that comes from. And so I, I you know, I think putting, uh, putting a more um, a, a, a understanding that it's a, that it is a continuum and that certain things develop faster than other things. And if, yeah. if we agree, right, if we can, and I don't know, but it's, it's way beyond my pay grade to try and figure out a legal system that will work in the future of uh, hybrids and all this stuff. Like, I don't know, but, but, but just as a, as a step to, uh, to accept that it's not a yes or no thing, that it's not, you know, the Twinkie defense is crazy, but serotonin actually does make neurons go. I mean, there's going to be a, like, it's a spectrum. We yeah. need to, we yeah. need to figure yeah. this out. Um, that's, I think part of it. So, so I agree with you. I, I just, I, you know, I can think of too many, um, in between cases, which I think will all show up. I think we're going to, you know, you got your, like right now you've got people that we say are non neurotypical. I mean, wait till you see what, what, what's yeah. coming when, right. When everybody's got all kinds of, you know, somebody's got a third hemisphere grafted on. So now they can actually, you know, they've got, they've got extra IQ points. And so you say, you know, you read like the rest of us wouldn't have been responsible, but you really should have known what, what you were doing. Cause you know, you got that third hemisphere, you know, the, the, these kinds of things are eventually going to show up. We're going to have to, we're going to have to figure it out. And I agree with you. And that's why I brought up the example of children. Uh, we don't yeah, yeah. have a definitive thing where they're persons. And in sure. fact, we have this weird capacity. We can even do it to some degree with the raising of dogs. If tr we can sort of treat things in the right way as persons and they start to approximate personhood. Mm. Um, and of course, we have individuals and people have seriously, and I don't mean just sloppily, reflected on whether or not psychopaths, people who seem to be uh, amoral, they seem to be blind yeah. to moral normativity, are properly persons. That's right. uh, precisely because they can't, they they lack the ability to undertake exactly that reciprocal recognition. And so, I, 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 again, I agree with you. I wasn't proposing a hard deadline, but I was proposing that there's confusion around personhood and humanity. And I think yeah. uh, calling somebody a human being, I think should be largely a psychobiological designation. I think calling somebody a person is we're bringing in a whole bunch of other criteria. Those criteria are probably going to shift. Um, I don't think they're finally definitive because I don't think anything is intrinsically or inherently relevant. Um, and that goes back to your butterfly again, right? Um, but I do think you there are mistakes that are happening in, in, in around this. And that's what I'm trying to point to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Gentlemen, we've reached that time that we had agreed prior to hitting record that we would uh, all have to come to a stop. So um, if you want to wind it down in the next couple of minutes, maybe some closing thoughts, um, and then we'll we'll uh, wrap this one. And I'll say right now that if you want to come back to this show, or if John and Greg, if you want to take this on to Transcendent Naturalism and continue the conversation, uh, the option is, is yours. But yeah, if you want to go ahead and uh, maybe make some final thoughts. John? Sure. Um, uh, well, right. I'll offer some. First off, uh, it's been a joy. Uh, a, a different, you know, uh, your continuum of intelligence, Michael, is, is a beautiful thing to play with. Uh, it's, a, it's an enlightening thing. Um, and I deeply appreciate uh, the, the way you're, uh, both the way you think uh, about it, the way you have researched it, uh, and the way you've articulated it here. Um, so for me, again, sort of I'm coming back, I keep coming back to um, I built you talk unified theory of knowledge to afford uh, us a potentially new grip, uh, both in relationship to the world and relationship to ourselves. Um, it, it affords this deep ontological continuity and the potential for enormous change going forward. Um, it, it embeds our understanding of categories in a structural relational patterning uh, close to a process theology um, of Whitehead, uh, but also then not so much uh, getting into the incredible weeds, but giving a basic optimal gripping of, hey, energy, matter, life, mind, culture, in these kind of, there's a continuity and discontinuity that I think can frame us and then place us as agents uh, in the arena uh, in a particular way that orients us more towards meaning in life. And of course, this is John's uh, work. So to then get together uh, and to jam and riff uh, around that and have that 
uh, music come alive here has been a real pleasure. So uh, I've deeply enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, likewise. Uh, so, so thank you, Justin, for putting this together. And I think, uh, I think you guys, uh, the work that you do is super important and I'm extremely happy that, uh, some of the biology and, and the computer science that we do can be, um, connected with these issues of, of personal interpersonal, um, these things that are very important for people. So, um, yeah. So thank you for doing that. I think that's, that's really important. Yes. Thank you, Justin, for putting this together. Great pleasure. Um, always a great pleasure to interact with you, uh, Greg. Um, and uh, Mike, I think this is the third time we've spoken and I'm, I'm continually amazed by, you know, the deep conversions between our work. We, we start in very different places and in some ways it looks like we're tackling very different problems, but when you push uh, on them, they seem to converge in really yeah. important and mutually supporting ways. And I find that very, very powerfully um, 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 encouraging about the plausibility of the overall framework. And so I'm deeply grateful for your work and um, always a pleasure. I hope that you and I talk again. Um, uh, and, you know, we, we, we sort of share students here and there and, um, and I, but it would be nice if you and I talked a little bit more regularly. So just yeah, uh, opening the in invitation to that. Yeah. Anytime, anytime. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Um, great fun. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'll say goodbye to you gentlemen after we stop record real quick, but I also want to acknowledge the YouTube audience. Thank you guys. I hope this was a, uh, I, I was jokingly thinking it's uh, uh, trialectic into trio logos here. We had three incredible <laughs> minds. So uh, that was a frame that I had set up. And speaking of frames, I really appreciate that you guys shed some light on the um, the dimensionality of a frame that's very large that we're working with. Also, perhaps maybe some frames getting broken on the smaller scale of beingness, selfness, and the fluidity, the continuation or the continuum of these selfness, beingness, of the psychosocial dynamic of that, all of that. So thank you guys so much. This was everything and more that uh, I was uh, aspiring to when I imagined this get together. So thank you very much. I appreciate your, thank you. your hard for work. And again, yeah. I am a, a loyal uh, student, maybe a little shallow in depth, but I, uh, I aspire <laughs> nonetheless. So anyway, but like I said, I'll say goodbye to you all off, uh, off camera here and uh, bye bye YouTube audience again. Thank you. Thank you. It is my conviction that philosophical argument alone is not enough to get people to turn to confronting the meaning crisis and the cultivation of wisdom. We need to be seduced into the love of wisdom through beauty. That beauty is the beauty not necessarily of making things pleasant or comfortable. That's the beauty that draws us in, intoxicates us and attracts us to something that we know we need to confront and encounter. This is one way of making sure that our philosophical task does not degenerate into mere philosophical discourse. We need to bridge between the conceptual and the non-conceptual and the metaphors, the symbols, the themes, the narrative structure, all of these other dynamics of meaning making will be there to help bridge between the more conceptual aspects of a philosophical reflection on meaning and a properly, like I say, embodied aspiration to becoming more wise. I will bring in pivotal moments that I think in some sense epitomize and portend the book as a whole, the work as a whole, and try to articulate some of the symbolic poesis that's going on there, the, the attempt to make sense and do that, not just conceptually, but symbolically in, the, in, a, in a profound sense of that. What kind of impact the author is trying to convey, what the author is suffering, what the author is undergoing, and how much that transformation of the author is the message in addition to the semantic content of the text itself. I look forward to seeing you. We journey together in the literature of the meaning crisis. First class will be April the 29th at 10 a.m. Eastern time. All the information you need for joining the course will be found in the notes to this video.